everyone. My name is Jeanne Klein. I am the coordinator of the Master Gardeners Public Speakers Bureau. And today we have Jack Landgreeb, one of our most experienced uh, Master Gardeners, and he's going to uh, discuss uh, basic landscape design on uh, envisioning our gardens. So take it away, Jack. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, just barely. Uh, I want to begin by saying that I'm not a professional designer of gardens. I've had no experience of that type. I'm just a master gardener who's taken a few courses and who's been around a lot of gardens over the years. And so I, <clears throat> I have a certain feel for what I think people are looking for when they're thinking about designing a garden or redesigning their own garden. And before we're finished, I hope that I at least get you to think outside the box. To think outside the box. And you'll see what that means when we get further along. We're gonna begin with some broad design elements. Call these the floor, the ceiling, and the rooms. And if you go to any kind of formal seminar on gardening, people will probably talk about these things specifically. We're talking about the floor of the garden, the rooms of the garden, the ceiling of the garden, just as if we were considering the interior of our homes. The floor, in the case of the garden, are the ground covers and the paths. So they, they consist of more than just living things. The ceiling is the tree canopy. Very important, as you'll see. The rooms include lots of information on the plant details, maybe garden art, walls, and so on. And we'll take each of these separately and, and maybe elaborate just a bit. So let's start with floors. Walkways and hardscapes might be one type of floor. And these could be concrete or stepping stones, non-living things. Bricks, patio stones, gravel mulch, volcanic rocks, you name it. There are lots of options. And depending upon which option you pick, it can give the garden a totally different feel. So if you like a particularly formal garden, you might want to go in one direction. If you like a less formal garden, you might want to go in a different direction. It may also depend upon the amount of money you have to spend. Ground cover areas include the living floors of gardens. And this can be lawns, vinca, liriope, foxandra, agapodium, and so on. And what you need to be aware of here is that they're not all extremely thin like a lawn. Well, maybe even if you look at Vinca, it's not as thin as a lawn. It goes up a few inches. And in some cases, there are some plants that go up more than a few inches. They might go up a half a foot or thereabouts and still be ground covers. Some of them last all through the year, like the lawn or maybe vinca. Some of them are seasonal. And we'll take a look at some options like that a little bit later. The ceiling of the garden, particularly important, are the trees and the tall shrubs, but it can also include arbors, awnings, pergolas, and the word pergola and arbors are often interchanged. So uh, don't think that, uh, that they're separate things necessarily. In, in the mind of many, they're really run together. And I'll, and I'll give you an example of that in a minute. Now here's, here's a pergola, pretty raw, nicely done. This is the sort of thing that you could conceivably do yourself, or you can have it done. And it can be topped with vines, uh, 
grape vines, for example, would be one possibility. Or instead of having boards across the top, it might even have some kind of a screen, which would give you more sunshade. Notice the floor. The floor is very simple, just bricks laid probably on sand, a gravel path with some stepping stones. So it's very informal in that sense. Now the rooms are more complicated because they can involve things that are obviously rooms in terms of how they're separated from the rest of the garden, maybe by a hedge, maybe an actual wall, stone, brick, concrete, possibly closely spaced shrubs, uh, but they don't have to be. They don't have to be separated in that way at all. They can be areas with specific plants or colors. Maybe one area of the garden, which isn't really physically separated from other areas, always has plants that bloom white. So no matter what the season or what plant is blooming, it's white. And in that case, that becomes a room within that garden. Even though it's not separated by a wall, it's not separated by a bunch of hedges, it's still separated. Uh, you could have an area around a sculpture or a topiary, which is a kind of a point of focus, and that becomes a room in the garden. Now, here, here's an example of a room. This was taken years ago, and believe me, it's changed. <laughs> but nevertheless, this is Agapodium which actually has some real depth to it. You can see it's uh, roughly a half foot off the ground on the average. And, and it turns out there's another ground cover under it, which is Vinca. And so the Vinca lasts all year round, even when the Agapodium is like you see it. So you have Agapodium, which is only there part of the year. It's not there in the winter, it dies completely back. It's there in the early spring, tends to die back in the summer, but some of it still remains. And, and then the vinca starts to show up. So you've always got a ground cover in this area and it's separated from a lawn area, which would be another room by a simple stone path, but it doesn't have to be that, it could be something else. Uh, and we'll see some examples of separators between rooms and gardens. This is an interesting terraced situation where there is a slope down from the front of a house into the backyard, off to the side. And, and the people here have done a, a very nice job of creating a nice wide uh, patio stone a walkway with nice curvature to it. And then they've terraced the hillside, which is done in a, in a beautiful way, in this case with very nice limestone block stones all the way up to the top. So it's fairly easy maintenance. And yet for the person walking between the front and the backyard, it's really a pleasant walk. Here's an example of a wooden bridge over a fake stream. That's all it takes is some river rocks. You don't have to have water. And, and if you pick your materials correctly, uh, you can have a lot of winter uh, presence here, which we'll talk about in a little while more specifically. But here, here's an evergreen. Here, this is an evergreen Euonymus. These are basically like evergreens because they're grasses and they will dry up in the late fall, but they remain looking good even in the winter. A little small lawn area separated by landscape timbers, pretty inexpensive and easy to place. 
Now, some general guidelines, what to plant and where to plant it. And here are the sequence of events that everyone ought to be very careful about. If you're looking at a blank slate, or if you're trying to redesign a garden that really you don't like, and you need to basically tear some of it out and replace it, you want to think about trees first, the ceiling of your garden. That's the most important thing. That's going to control where the shade is, depending upon where the sun is and which way the garden faces. Shrubs, probably less so, but depending upon the size of the shrubs, they also can have an effect on shading and where you put other types of flowering plants. Lawns and perennial beds, and finally annual beds, or they can be mixed. So the order is one, two, three, just as we've done it on the slide, starting with the trees and ending with various flower beds. Now the right plant, right place rule. It's very, very important when it comes to figuring out what plants you're going to place where. And the first rule of thumb is know the mature height and diameter of whatever you're planting. Particularly important for trees, maybe a little less important for shrubs, but still very important because you don't want to plant shrubs close to the house. Plant trees apart by at least 75% of each mature radius combined. Let's say that you've got two trees. They don't have to be the same tree. And let's say for the sake of mathematical simplicity that they have a diameter of 10 feet. The radius is five. So you've got five feet from one tree, five feet from the other tree, 10 feet, 75% of 10 is seven and a half feet. So what this rule says is don't plant them closer together than seven and a half feet. Otherwise, there's a chance that as these trees grow toward maturity, that they'll start to overlap, they'll shade each other, they'll start to change in their appearance as one side grows differently than the other. And you're going to have, ultimately, problems that you don't want. And it won't look good. Shrubs have to be well away from house walls because you have to worry about maintaining the house walls. And if you can't get behind the shrub to do that, that's going to create a real problem. And you're going to have to constantly be trimming the backside of that hedge in order to trim it away from the house so you can get in there to paint and do other types of maintenance. Mature height versus overhead lines. The rule here is don't plant trees that grow more than 15 feet if there's an overhead line. Now, the overhead line may be 25 feet in the air, maybe 20 feet in the air. But if you start planting things like oak trees, they're going to they're going to overcome that distance and eventually be a problem. So you want to stick to trees that are more like undercover, understory trees, trees that will grow under other trees are often uh, particularly useful for this type of thing. Uh, red buds and and a whole variety of other some dogwoods are in this category. Mature height, less than 15 feet or thereabouts. Look into water requirements. You don't want to plant in one area. Plants that require a lot of water with plants that are very drought resistant. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be overwatering the plants that are drought resistant or underwatering the plants that really want more water. Winter interest, something to always think about. 
you know, you think about what your garden looks like in the summer and spring, maybe in the fall too. But what about the winter? Do you have some plants that will stand out in one way or another during those winter months? Now they can either be plants that have uh, leaves that turn color in the fall, but they keep those leaves during a good part of the winter, or plants that stay green during virtually all of the winter, like boxwoods. Uh, burning bush is another one that tends to stay looking halfway good all winter long, uh, sometimes red during the entire winter. Some azaleas will do this too. Some euonymus plants will keep their color and their leaves all during the winter, even though in the spring of the year, they may get, they probably will get new leaves and the old leaves will eventually drop off. Some facts about the Douglas County Agricultural Zone that you want to keep in mind when you're thinking about what plant to put where. And this refers to winter temperatures, not, not to summer heat index. We are in Douglas County in zone six, have been now for a uh, number of years. And the problem with that is that there are, at least according to the agriculture people, two zones, zone 6A and zone 6B. And when you look at the label on a plant, the chances are pretty good that it's not going to tell you that. It's just going to say zone six. Now you might be lucky and it might actually have a temperature that that plant will, can handle. Uh, so if it says minus 10 or minus 15, something like that, then it's probably a zone 6A plant. And it's probably going to be safe in the Lawrence area. If it's zone 6B, you can't be sure. It probably will be safe, but if you have a, a winter where, which like last winter, where there were temperatures down in the minus 10 range for several days running, even though it was only during the, the nighttime, uh, nevertheless, plants died and they, will, they may not last if they're in that category. So you want to be particularly careful about that, that uh, feature of a plant. Perennials. I'm not going to give you a blow by blow on a whole lot of perennials. We're not, we're not here to talk about that. What I want you to do is to think about the features of perennial plants that you might want to keep in mind when you're designing a garden. Texture, leaf shape, plant size and shape, leaf coloration, bloom color, bloom time, all of those things. Some of them may be important, some of them may be not important in a particular area that you're talking about, <clears throat> but nevertheless, you want to take them all into account. And, and very often it's useful to mix different kinds of plants with different features, even though their colors may be somewhat similar. Water features. They can range from very simple, like this one, to much more complicated and much more expensive. So it just depends on your pocketbook, and it depends on your ingenuity. And a lot of these water features can be built by the average gardener. Uh, this one is probably one of the simplest, where all you have to do is drill a hole in the rock, period. Get a pump, put it in a, uh, a reservoir underneath the rock, and then run a hose from the pump up through the hole in the rock, and, you, and that's it, you're there. Uh, so you really don't have to do anything else. Here's one that's quite simple. Uh, I've used this one for years, and it's it's just a simple 
pottery jug laying on its side so that water spills out into a small pool, runs down a very small creek, and then into a reservoir. And the pump is down in that reservoir. And a lot of these now, in the winter time, if you have a reservoir and the pump is down in the reservoir and the reservoir is full of water, they can last all winter and you do not need to remove the pump from the reservoir. It will not be hurt. Here's an example of a, uh, of a pond, which was in one of our Lawrence tours, actually, a uh, garden tour of years ago, uh, just to show you something that's a little different. Now, this would be a water feature that's obviously more, more involved, more expensive, uh, takes more work to build, obviously. And some of that you might want to have done professionally, and some of it you could probably do yourself. Color and variegation, something to consider. That is, sometimes a leaf which is uniformly one color works great. Uh, the bleeding heart that's at the top, for example, has this pale yellow green color. And, and if it's in a garden area where you have other darker green leaf plants, especially if the leaves are different, different size, different shape, uh, those go together great and, and they give you some contrast. You can also have leaves that have variegated colors like Jack Frost, uh, Granera at the bottom. Uh, variegated colors ranging from green to white to silver or green to yellow to ivory. Uh, there are a lot of hostas that have variegated colors that you can take advantage of. So there are a lot of opportunities here to put something interesting into the garden that will be eye-catching. Now, some design examples. And believe me, there are an unlimited number of these available. And, and what I'm going to suggest is, if you're interested in seeing a lot of gardens, and of a particular type even, uh, what you need to do is simply either use Google or uh, one of your browsers that you're familiar with, any of them that will work, and put in garden design images or garden images. And you'll run into so many that you will not have time to see them all because there'll be hundreds. And, and, and these are fantastically uh, divided up into little categories. So if you're particularly interested in rock gardens, you can limit it to rock gardens and you can see a hundred rock gardens that someone has designed and, and get all kinds of ideas for what you might want to do with your particular rock garden. If you have a small area of your garden and you want that to be a garden unto itself, separated from maybe a larger part of the garden, there are plenty of examples of that. And so what I'll do, I'm going to show you some examples. We'll talk about a few of them. Some of them require uh, maybe a little more talking than others, but they're all quite interesting to look at. And I hope you enjoy them. All right, take a look at these two. I'm starting with these two for a particular reason. On the left, you'll notice that, first of all, it's, it's very nicely designed. There's a curved, beautiful wide pathway to the front door from the uh, garage driveway. And then along the way, there's an area here which is mulched. There's separated by a, a small rock wall from a planted area behind, which is closer to the house. This has winter features. In the winter time, you're gonna have these tall uh, topiary shaped evergreens. 
on either side. And there's one way down here too. There are actually three of them. You also have junipers. Not sure whether that might be a boxwood. Well, boxwood maybe over here. Uh, so there are plenty of plants that will maintain themselves during the winter and look good. And this area here could be planted as well with a variety of perennials or annuals. So there, there are options here for the future. But in the meantime, it's simple. The maintenance will be low. And yet it has a certain elegance to it. Now, let's take a look at this one. Nice brick walkway leading straight to the front door. Along the walkway are hedges. Now, the hedges are properly cut the way you would cut a hedge in a formal garden. They're pretty close together, and it looks crowded. You've got these narrow aisles between the hedges. High maintenance, much higher maintenance than over here. Lots of tall plants blocking the house. So maybe this garden has some problems that you might want to think about. Now, I couldn't resist this one because it's like a cul-de-sac in a garden. Uh, but it, it's really beautiful, as you can see from all the plants and the flowers. It has tremendous variety of winter interest plants as well as flowering plants. And it's got this great bench, which sort of draws you in, maybe with a book in your hand to sit down and read for a while, or a cup of coffee, or maybe something else. <laughs> you and a friend could come in here and have a nice talk. So this has, this has its features, even though it's small. Nevertheless, it doesn't represent necessarily the whole garden. There's probably other parts to this garden, and this is just one little piece. Now, less formal is this. I always have thought this was very well done. Notice the stone steps with lots of ground cover growing in between. Nicely placed. They have a slight curvature as you go down this hill. Lots of wildflowers. Looks like echinacea maybe over here. Uh, this could be, I don't know, could be a butterfly plant. Hard, hard to tell sometimes in some of these. Maybe some lavender. But in any event, obviously not a formal garden in any sense, but it's still beautiful and attractive. Over here is an old house. Looks like it's still in good shape, but very plain at the corner with the gravel in front. And what these people did was very simple. They put a few potted plants, two of them at the ground level with different height plants in them, and one of them up on a stand, several of them in fact. And those really add a certain feature to that house that changes its character as you look at the house from the front. So it doesn't take much sometimes to change your focus. This one's slightly fuzzy. But nevertheless, front door here, come down the front steps. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. Come down the front steps, and garage is here. 
they've done a really nice job of this. And the reason I'm showing you this is, is not only the, the nice curvature, but also the separation between the lawn and the planted area. There's mulch in this planted area. Obviously, they've got an edge, probably a plastic edge, I would guess. Uh, there are some metal edges that will work too, but my, my guess is it's probably a plastic edge and, and it makes a sharp demarcation between the lawn and the mulched area where the plants are located. There is some winter interest here, some plants that are going to be around in the winter. What's interesting is that after they get, came down the steps, instead of walking all the way around the end and back to the lawn, they put in these two stepping stones, which made sense to me. So you could step right across into the lawn area and, and you never know, there may be something of real interest over here to the right. So here's an example of something that's fairly simple and straightforward. And it has, it has a certain elegance to it. Now this one uh, is a fantastic garden. Notice that we have a house on a hill. I'm not certain whether the hill is in the backyard or, the, or whether that's really the front of the house. Not totally clear to me. Uh, maybe someone else can figure that out. But nevertheless, I think here, what's interesting is you've got a lot of steps leading up the hill, up to the level of where the house foundation is. And they put some very beautiful potted plants at key locations along the way to provide a kind of a special focus and some additional color. And then about this far up, there is, although it's hard to see, there's, there's a pathway which leads over to a small patio. And in that patio, you can see at least one chair. My guess is there's probably a couple of chairs up there. And, and there's also a fire pit. So you have a gathering place where people can gather, talk, roast marshmallows, whatever. But, but it's, a, it's a beautifully done garden. It's got very nice plantings, not too many, uh, just the right number. Plenty of plants that'll provide winter interest. A lot of trees, but not too many. So it's not the middle of a dense forest. So there's still sunshine that obviously gets through to these plants without any problem. Now, here's a, here's a completely different feel. This is someone that had a small area in the back, probably, in the backyard. And they wanted to entertain and they wanted it to be very functional and they didn't want a big garden. So they've got, first of all, they've got a beautiful fence, probably expensive too. On the top, on the bottom actually of the slide, you'll see there's a, there's a deck here and the deck wraps around to an area that has a table and some chairs. And then they've got this beautiful waterfall, a pool at the top, overflowing in the waterfall down to a small uh, water garden at the bottom. Some very nice potted shrubs, plants, which are different in color and kind of the uh, features along this pathway that sort of soften the harshness of just having stone. Over here, a little bit of a raised garden for a garden area. Storage shed, where you have a, an upraised, very small lawn. 
That lawn probably takes five minutes to mow, if that. And there's a little bit of a raised bed way back here with some additional plantings. So, really different, unique, more modern maybe. Beautiful walkway to the front door. Uh, very nicely done. A really nice shaped planted area and a feature that really adds focus and attracts your eye, this blue fountain. So you have a beautiful fountain on the way into the front door, surrounded by plants and flowers. I mean, this, this is a nicely done front garden. Now, I'm not a big fan of symmetry, but symmetry is something that you need to think about. These people happen to have a, uh, a walkway that went pretty much straight to their front door. And they have a tree on each side of the walkway. They look like the same, same kind of tree. And uh, they put in this interesting fence, which is on both sides. And they've got a couple of evergreens that are on both sides. And they've got plantings, which are on both sides. And one side of the planting is the mirror image of the other side. Now, normally, I'm kind of a fan of not having things symmetrical. I like things that are not symmetrical. I think they add certain interest, but in this case, this thing really does look pretty good. And I think they've done a good job of it. No question about it. Uh, they've got mulched areas where the plants are that looks good. I'm not sure how good it will be in the middle of the season when weeds have grown in, but nevertheless, looks pretty good. Uh, probably not a lot of maintenance connected with this garden, but it does look nice. Here's an interesting front garden, small lawn, winter interest shrubs, here, 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 uh, a very nice, planter box located, well, located in the mid middle window, but there are also some hanging planters off to the side and up here uh, to kind of draw your eye upward. And over here in the corner uh, is this beautiful planter with plants on the top, a little bit higher up than the regular lawn area and the other plants that are down here. So this one has actually uh, some nice features to it. It's a small lawn again in the front. And, and there's a pathway down here. Now, this is a more formal yard at this, this home. Notice that the area, the areas around these hedges are very simple, just gravel. There is some maintenance issue here with this particular yard because you're going to have to trim these hedges. And there are quite a few all the way around. Plenty of winter interest, but some maintenance issues maybe. On the other hand, it looks good and it's all done with straight lines. So there are no real curves here. This is all straight line. Boxes. Even the L shape, there are boxes, rectangles. I 
think sometimes that can look good. Other times, you might not want that. Here's a house that has done something that I think is was very worthwhile. They put that white fence in and they didn't put the white fence right at the edge of the sidewalk. They put it back a little way so that they could have a planted area providing a kind of a softening effect between the house itself and the sidewalk where you've got some nice plantings along the way and from the hedge. Uh, there are some winter interest plants along the walkway that leads into the front door. The walkway is not perfectly straight. It actually has some curvature to it. And it also has some steps upward. Uh, they've got a very nice raised planted area with stone blocks back here and plantings that are on the other side of those blocks. So overall, I would say it looks pretty good. Small area in a backyard. This one really different from that slightly more uh, stark one that I showed you earlier. This one has a very has a simple kind of fence variable height depending upon where it's located simple gravel pathway after a couple of stone steps it's got a, an area with a small square table probably room for several chairs maybe something like that but maybe no more than that it's got this interesting lawn sort of a semicircular lawn plantings all around, uh, mostly in the same color, or generally in the same color. It's got a feature here which catches your eye as you walk toward the table. Now this happens to be, a, this is a picture actually in Lawrence of probably one of the most widely known years ago water gardens uh, in the city. And, and this is only showing you a tiny piece of this water garden. Beautifully done. It has, it has streams, multiple waterfalls, uh, all sorts of areas where you can walk and look over overlooks into various directions into the into the bond. There's a deck up here. Now here's a kind of a, an interesting cul-de-sac. Uh, this is an area where you're you're drawn into a dead end down here. Uh, but you're drawn in with a, a really interesting shape, all very curved but irregular. Lots of nice plantings. This is the spring of the year. You can see the alliums over here, for example. Uh, lots of winter interest. Beautifully done. Really, really nicely done. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't show you some vegetable gardens. Yes, vegetable gardens can look good. And here's an example of a couple of them. Now, they might, they might want to use mulch in here. Uh, this doesn't happen to have any, but probably it would be wise to have some mulch in between the rows. But nevertheless, it obviously looks good. It's kept clean and tidy. And it's raised bed. Now this one is a little different. Uh, it's got some very simple paths in amongst 
the various areas where they're growing vegetables. And back here, you can see they're, they've got a screen in the very back. I think that must be sunflowers behind the screen. I have a feeling that's what it looks like. Probably marigolds down here. Now, modern, different, simple. Got some nice plantings. They're up in planter boxes, raised beds, so to speak, uh, located as you see them here with benches around. Stone steps leading to this small lawn. Uh, this looks like it's probably part of a much larger, I'm sure this is a larger patio down here, which is not in the photo. All right, this is where we stop. End of the road and ready for questions. Thank you so very much, uh, Jack. That was uh, interesting. Um, uh, does anyone have questions that they would like to ask? Uh, feel free to simply unmute yourself and uh, ask a question. Hi, Jack. Hi, John. Sorry, I was late. I had to bike home from the medicinal garden today. So You're okay, <laughs> mess. <laughs> Happy to have you here. Oh, um, no, I love seeing these pictures because it's always get, gives a good idea. And I'm really terrible, terrible uh, at design. Um, so I'm wondering, Jack, is there any sort of an online, like a, a, a game toy where that would help you visualize what you want to do? Have you ever found anything that you oh, like? No, I haven't. I haven't really looked carefully for that. Uh, I did one time and I ran into something, but it wasn't very flexible. Yeah. And, you know, depending upon what you wanted to do, it, it wouldn't really do very much. It, uh, you can get some that I think will give you circles for different areas of the garden. Uh, but as far as looking at the details of, you know, I want to make this shape a particular shape and Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I want to make this a burn and, and so on. There was just nothing that would do that. Yeah. And so it, you're better off with a piece of blank paper and a pencil. <laughs> you know, Sharon, years ago, I did find some kind of a program um, that did have like little animate little pieces of you know like a green shrub a red shrub yeah uh, right you know and then you could move the colors around you know because I was trying to decide you know like what sorts of shapes heights different colors of shrubs I wanted to put against a back fence you know and I yeah, started you probably find, find that yeah, yeah and but but then you know I finally got to the point where I should just cut those suckers out and just move them around in a piece of paper you know <laughs> just so um because I I never really you know was able to have complete control of everything that I wanted to play with. Cause I also, I wanted to do more than just, here's the back row of shrubs. I wanted I know, to you know, I know. do all the perennials in front of it, right? Um, with it's kind of like the kindergarten version of design a garden. Exactly, you know? So yeah, I think that programs might be out there but they're hard to find, yeah. Yeah, that's true. That is true. Well, since I, I miss most of the programming, I, I don't know about questions, but I do have a comment that in terms of a focal point, Jack, you were talking about focal points and I have this little patch in my very small patch, it's my pollinator patch. And it's one of those places that I just put plants. You know, Jean gave me some and I put them there, you know, uh, split them and I leftover plants from the native plant sale and I put them over there and it's just this sort of random collection. And it always bothered me, but I never really had a design for it because it's so small. I put a bird bath right in like off center on a corner and it has just, it's lovely. Uh -huh. It has made that an, like an actual garden. Uh -huh. It's just amazing. Uh -huh. Yeah, I was going to suggest something like that. 
even if you had a, a, a nice looking potted plant, could be one of the other plants that you're talking about, a uh, nice looking potted plant maybe on a stand located somewhere like in the middle of that garden or off to the side, not quite in the middle. And uh, that would catch people's eye and make them focus on, hey, what's going on here in this garden? And, and then I don't know how you would tell them what's going on, but, but nevertheless, they might be able to figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. Or how about a, maybe a butterfly? Yeah. A metal butterfly. Yeah, I've got one of those too. <laughs> <laughs> it, never yeah. seemed, it never seemed to work. It needed that uh, a colorful item. Focal point. Uh, and it needed, yes, it was a focal yeah. point. Butterfly, metal butterfly I had was just sort of a, just rust, just a rust metal butterfly. So it never really captured the eye. You almost had to find it. Yeah, you need the country. Oh, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 that could be true. I know in my own yard, it's a, such a tiny um, city lot and I feel like it's one big room. <laughs> I mean, even though when I'm playing in it, I feel like I'm, I'm living in different rooms, you know, kind of what you're talking about, Sharon, with, you know, a, a, a place where you toss extra plants, you know, that you, that you have, that yeah, you figure yeah. out later. Etc. Um, and and so it was. It's kind of hard. And so I, I'm also. Um, I've always been interested in debates between crowding plants together because I want one of everything, and having spaces between plants. A lot of the examples you showed have all these large spaces between plants, probably because well, for different reasons. They may only have you know they want a low maintenance one bed. Um, other people have gobs of, of acreage so they can spread out and have multiple rooms. So I'm just curious to know if, if um, what, how people fall on the side of, you know, crowd everything together or, or keep lots of spaces apart in, from a design perspective. Well, and as plants grow and sometimes spread, they are going to take up those spaces and, and eventually they're going to get a lot closer together. And that's, I'm sure that's true for some of those gardens. Some of those gardens, if you look carefully at, for example, the lawns, you could see that that lawn was just put in. I mean, it's like the house has just been built. Right. And they're putting in, a, they're putting in everything fresh and new. And, uh, and so plants tend to be spaced more. Uh, they're spread out more. But as time goes on, that will change. <laughs> And as time goes on, those trees will grow bigger and produce more shade. And so the nature of the garden underneath is gonna change. I was also really intrigued with your idea of planting vinca underneath bishop's weed. Yeah. So you have well, winter actually, interest, but works. then it, it, they didn't think they could coexist like that. Well, you know, I, I did it in one area with uh, Agapodium and uh, Lily of the Valley, interestingly. And, and the Lily of the Valley uh, comes up first. And so you've got nothing but Lily of the Valley and lots of flowers. And then that all goes away. The flowers go away. And the lily of the valley stays there, but the agapodium then starts to grow among it and, and above it. It'll grow up over it. Doesn't seem to hurt the lily of the valley. Interesting, yeah. It's still there. Yeah. I know I've done that with, uh, I have um, ivy around um, my two pin oak trees, uh, as well as vinca. And in the one um, area in front of my office, I planted uh, Virginia bluebells under the ivy. So every okay. spring I have this gorgeous little patch, a little room of Virginia bluebells, then they go dormant. And then every year I buy some shade, uh, annual uh, shade begonias and I just plant them, you know, in, in the spaces around the ivy. So I think it's, it's great to think about your different uh, beds as, you know, again, through the seasons of how you can use them with different looks for different, different seasons. Yeah, the gardens are gonna look different at different times of the year. 
You know, I was also thinking, oh, sure. Oh, and I was just gonna say, something I've never been good at, but something that it'd be nice to, to emphasize is this just st that strategic use of annuals. I mean, because I've got mostly perennials mm -hmm. um, and, but then I end up with blank spaces like where my Virginia bluebells are mm -hmm. and uh, just paying more attention to that and using annuals, which I had previously pretty much ignored and not wanted to deal with, but mm -hmm. it's a great idea to just plant them over what's gone dormant. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's right. You know, yeah. another um, aspect to think about um, for folks, obviously, if families have um, lots of children, you want areas of your, your property to uh, have play spaces, perhaps, for the kids, right? Um, whether it's, you know, obviously, there could be a playground equipment, but I'm also thinking um, just between, you know, the lawn and then the hardscaping. And I'm wondering about, you know, you showed a lot of examples of hardscaping with these hard rock, you know, pathways and patio spaces and so forth. And I just wonder to what extent people think about their kids falling down on this, on these hard rock concrete spaces and hurting themselves. I'm wondering if anybody ever thinks about that, if you've ever come across any discussions about that. Yeah, they, <clears throat> there are, there are rubber pellets that people have used for things like that, where they, they put some sort of a Oh, probably a weed barrier down first to screen the ground and then put on top of it a layer of, oh, it's like, it's like rubber, rubber pellet, rubber, I don't know what you want to call them, rubber rocks almost. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and those things, it's almost like mulch made out of rubber. And, and that solves that problem. I don't know how easy it is to keep clean over a period of time. Uh, and eventually, the problem with a lot of things like that is that eventually, the leaves that fall will eventually get in there, decompose, and you'll start to get soil-like conditions where plants can grow. And then when seeds come down from the trees, especially, they're going to get into those areas and start to sprout. And so you'll have, there's a maintenance problem, mm -hmm. trying to get those guys out of there. Yeah, now, there are a lot of practical problems. Right, because I think your emphasis on maintenance um, is really important. People need to, you know, if you're designing from scratch on a blank slate, or if you're designing something or redesigning something you're, that you've purchased, um, people first of all need to think about how much time do you want to spend working on, you know, in the different beds, the different rooms of the garden and so forth um, around existing trees and, and things like that. Um, the other thing that, that struck me too is a lot of those um, garden, um, a lot of those pathways um, uh, that you showed were pretty wide. So it seems like some people mm -hmm. were thinking ahead in terms of ADA, you know, compliance of having a wide enough path for um, uh, wheelchairs, people in, in wheelchairs to, um, you know, visit unencumbered. Yeah, there are probably very few gardens that really think about that. Mm -hmm. John, did you see there's a question in the chat? Oh, no, I didn't see one. Sorry, goodness gracious. Um, right, how about planning uh, one section for all of the seasons? Do you have each season individually and layer the pages? I mean, do you do each season individually and then layer, um, I'm not sure what we mean by pages. <clears throat> well, yeah, I don't, I don't think most of these gardens probably were not season specific. Uh, they're gonna look different in different seasons, but they'll still be beautiful areas mm -hmm. to be in. Uh, so I don't, I don't think there's, it's very hard, I think, to have a garden where this is the winter garden and this is the spring garden. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could certainly plant plants that come up only in the spring in one area. And then what is it going to look like the rest of the year? Well, maybe it'll just be green mm -hmm. and, and nothing else. That's possible. Uh, but it still has interest no matter what. And that's why you want to think about more than 
than just when it's flowering, it's going to look this way. But when it's not flowering, what's it going to look like? And that's where you want to look at things like variegation in color and, and that type of thing, uh, where you can kind of focus on other aspects of what you've planted, different shapes of flowers, of, of leaves rather, uh, some variegated, some not variegated, different colorations of the leaf, different textures, mm -hmm. finely divided versus large. Yeah, I think most people do plan all their beds to have different season interests within the same bed. Um, and, and I think your point about starting with the winter interest, starting with um, you know, evergreen trees or, the, or your mature trees and so forth makes a whole lot of sense and then trying to design around that as well. Well, that's right. And, and when you're looking at a new garden and it's in the spring or summer, you need to ask yourself if you're making changes extensively or starting from scratch, you know, what is it going to look like in the winter? Right. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, maybe the whole front of the house gets pretty blah during the winter. Mm -hmm. Well, if you don't like blah, then you want to try to do something different. Yeah. Unfortunately, we are out of time. You filled the, our time so well, it, it just whizzed by with lots of different uh, ideas and, and tips and stuff for uh, us to think about. So I just want to uh, remind folks this will be available online on our YouTube channel so that people can come back to it and uh, continue to uh, be inspired by some uh, landscape design ideas. So thank you again so very much, Jack, and thank you, Sharon. And thank you for um, other folks who um, have, have visited and posed questions. Uh, lots for us to think about. Everyone have a good day. Take Thanks, care. Jack. Thanks, Sean. Glad I caught some of it. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. Bye. All right. Cut out. Well, very interesting. Okay. Well, you saw how it's done. Yeah, yeah. Um.